Prof Mazur, we can go ahead. I would like to take this opportunity to uh, to welcome you uh, to to this um, webinar on vaccine access strategy. Um, we this initiative is a joint initiative uh, between the National School of Government and the Vet, Vet School of of Governance, and supported by various partners, um, Aspen, Telcom, and APSA. And we're very grateful for. Uh, for working with us uh, as an institution of higher learning to, to bring you these conversations. Uh, we have a lineup of top experts uh, in, in the field and um, my uh, uh, fellow co-host, uh, Professor Busani Ngaweni will in a short while introduce, introduce them. We first launched this initiative in 20, uh, early 2020 uh, this initiative on vac vaccine access and, and equity. There, there were several factors that triggered this. The first was um, the incident of holding of, of vaccines by advanced industrial uh, economies, especially in, this, in the second half of uh, 2020, when many of them uh, made uh, pre-purchases of doses, uh, in some instances four times uh, than the requirements of, of their citizens. The second was uh, the emergence of vaccine diplomacy as an element of geopolitical contestation between the US, China, and, and Russia, among others, with a selective distribution of vaccines as, as an element or as a strategy to carve out uh, spheres of influence. Uh, the third factor really was um, a growing risk that uh, global economic recovery would assume a bifurcated uh, track with those countries that had early on uh, managed to make uh, pre-purchases, um, uh, able to vaccinate their, uh, their citizens and reviving their economic activity. Whereas uh, those countries, many of, of which are in sub-Saharan Africa that were not able to access vaccines uh, because of uh, fiscal resources, uh, pre-purchases by advanced industrial economies, and lack of manufacturing capacity uh, lagging behind or left uh, behind in, in global economic uh, recovery. So we, we thought it would help to run a series of conversations on what can be done to close this gap and, and how we can uh, accelerate uh, access to vaccines, especially for African countries. There are no doubt uh, contentious arguments about um, uh, various aspects of, um, of, of vaccine access, uh, especially uh, the precise value of the intellectual property waiver that was championed by South Africa and, and India early uh, 2020 and recently supported by the Biden administration in the US, among others. Some views suggest that uh, this will not in any way lead to overnight the availability of scientific know-how or, or create a base for human capital uh, or or instantaneously um, generate manufacturing capability because uh, all of a sudden you, you have access to, to the patents. But on the other hand, some have argued back that even so, IP waiver has value for unlocking more supply by those countries that have capacity to manufacture, but not the patents. Uh, thankfully, I think the, there is some convergence of views and uh, I think this is moving forward um, in, in new directions uh, with, uh, with insights imagining that, um, you know, we, we could look at uh, strategic transfer of technology to, to developing countries uh, who could then, not, not just transfer of technology, but also uh, training of human capital who could then gradually develop capacity for this pandemic and future pandemic to ensure uh, resilience. So these conversations are, are not for their own sake, but will also help us to draw insights from the various experts uh, that we can then uh, share with uh, decision makers. We are also hoping to convene closed policy dialogues 
with decision makers to concretize these views in public policy. And as a school of governance, uh, we see ourselves as at the cutting edge of uh, shaping public policy, uh, influencing uh, processes in governance, uh, and also working alongside government and partners in the private sector to solve uh, some of the complex uh, challenges. Uh, Busani Ngaweni, who is the principal at the National School of Governance, will be moderating the rest of this session, but I just want to take this opportunity to welcome you all and, and to thank uh, our speakers for taking time, uh, precious time to, to come and share their knowledge, their insights and, and their wisdom with us. Over to you, Busani. Uh, thank you very much, Shimzu, for that. Uh, can I request Lerato just to show the agenda, the running order, so that everyone can see how we lined up for today? Uh, it's a very you know, straightforward running order. We want this to be as free flowing as, uh, as possible. Um, and so please do use the chat, the Q&A platform, so that as the speakers are talking, if you've got questions or comments, please be free to engage in that platform. They will come back later on to respond to some of the questions and comments that you will, have, uh, you will have made. We want this to be dynamic. We don't want it to run as if it's a, you know, it's a lecture where we are teaching you who are here. Most of you are interested and may already have some information about what we are dealing with today, but please do feel free to robustly engage our panelists. We've got a very distinguished, uh, you know, panelist as you'll see in the next, uh, in the next, in the next page. Firstly, We'll have uh, Stavros Nikolaou, who is with uh, Stavros is with Aspen, uh, you know, Pharmacare. You know, some of you, I'm sure, will be engaging him about some of the controversial things, the albeit uh, fake news that is circulating at the moment. We were deliberately inviting him because not only is he just a, a pharmacist and producing a product there, but he also is engaging on the political. Uh, economy of vaccine uh, you know, uh, production. He may be familiar uh, with some of you. He's a, he's a business leader and is also an alumni of, uh, of, of VET. So thanks, uh, Stavros, for agreeing to be part of this conversation uh, today. So you'll be coming first, and you will be then followed by uh, Martin Freddy from WHO. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Martin, for agreeing to participate here. We appreciate that you are under extreme pressure uh, at, at the moment, but uh, just agreeing to engage with us here, you know, in South Africa being, we are the epicenter of the pandemic in the African continent, you know, currently. And so some of the insights that you will be sharing based on very important R&D work that you are leading at WHO will be of benefit to us. Colleagues will see then we've got industry player hands, we've got Stavros, we've got multinational, uh, you know, at a multinational level, we've got uh, Martin who's engaging. And finally, we've got uh, a, a colleague from the Department of Science and Innovation, Claudina, who is a call face of designing, uh, you know, policy. She will also be sharing perspective. Thank you, Claudina, for also being here. So that is how colleagues should see how we invited those who are participating in the session uh, to the policymaker within a you know, government. We've got uh, someone from the industry. And most importantly, we've got uh, Martin from WHO who will be sharing a perspective from the multinational uh, perspective. We will be giving each of, uh, you know, use Stavros about you know, five minutes. After that, we will go and have a, a longer input from uh, Martin then Claudine, and we will come back later on then to have a, a conversation. So over to you, Stavros, followed by Martin and Claudina. I will not uh, be interfering. So as soon as Stavros is uh, done, we then move on to Martin and, and Claudina, and I will come back only after the three of you who have spoken. Thank you very much. Stavros. Thanks, uh, Busani. Thanks, um, uh, professors and colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good morning. and. Thanks very much to 
the WITS School of Governance for, for this invitation and in particular for selecting this topic. I can't think of too many more important topics right now, both for, for humanity and also the political economy, as Busani put it. So your, uh, your intervention is, is very timeless. Um, may I at the outset uh, to say that without stating the obvious, um, th this pandemic uh, has exposed many, many uh, frailties. Um, it's, it's exposed many disparities. And I think the list of um, some of the, the seismic, often called so-called seismic shifts that we are seeing um, have been both unanticipated, but also very deep and far reaching. And none of them is more prominent and or profound than if we look at the, the, the current uh, vaccine distribution and rollout program in global terms. So we know that around 2.5 billion doses almost of of uh, COVID vaccine doses have been administered globally. And it's, uh, it's, it's poignant and both telling that Africa has only received around 40 million of those. So if you, if you do the maths, um, you will see that uh, although Africa represents 1.3 billion people, it has received less than 0.5%, yes, I'm, I'm gonna repeat that, less than 0.5% of the vaccines that have either been rolled out or administered. Facilities such as COVAX that were set up, uh, looking to support the least developing, the least developed and developing nations around the world, I think have been met with only minimal if any success. And what this pandemic, amongst other things, has taught us is that this is like the, the TV show Hunger Games, when it's, it's every man for himself. And uh, to, to a large degree, as we can talk about solidarity and global solidarity and all of that, the reality is that the procurement of these vaccines is being led by governments around the world, including in our own country. And I, I probably can't blame governments for, governments for looking after their citizens first. So it becomes a scramble to see who can look after their citizens first, even if you're doing it at the expense of the Global Solidarity Project. Of course, what do we derive from this? We, we derive, importantly, that that nothing beats local. You have to have your own local capacities, both with respect to this pandemic and any other future pandemic. And just generally speaking, you can never guarantee health security and or security of supply unless you are equipped to have your own capacity, your own manufacturing and your own distribution. And sadly, Africa is right at the back of the queue when it comes to that. Um, just very briefly, the way we looked at this as, as Aspen, um, Aspen has been a serial investor in, in sterile capability. We've, we've evolved our business. We're a fairly young business, a 23 year old business. But over that period of time, we've evolved our business model from being a commodity generics company to a more specialized steriles player these days. Um, by way of example, we're the leading supplier of anesthetics that's general and local anesthetics, uh, globally speaking. And we've invested significantly in building that capacity, that sterile capacity um, in, in the Eastern Cape. And we have some of that in, in France as well, but the flagship facility is Eastern Cape. So what does this all mean for the country and the continent investing in steriles? It's given us an opportunity to diversify into vaccine manufacture. Now, let me just unpack vaccine manufacture for a moment, the two minutes that I've got left. The vaccine manufacture consists of three steps. The first is the production of the active substance. That's the end 
antigen that goes into the vaccine that exhibits the immunogenic effect once it's administered to a patient. Uh, the continent and our own country here, South Africa, do not have that capability as yet. There are various technology platforms. I'm sure Claudina will go through those, but we don't have any of those as yet in our country. So that's the first stage. The second stage is what we call fill and finish. So that means taking the active substance, which is in a liquid, putting it in buffer solutions, and then filling that final solution into a vial, uh, in our instance, it's a vial, uh, heating the, the, the vial, um, so you mold it in a, particular, uh, in, in, a, in a particular position, and then you cap it with a rubber cap so that you ensure the, the aseptic and sterility nature of what is required here. So that's the second stage, and that is what Aspen is doing. Uh, we're the only manufacturer thus far on the continent that is doing fill and finish of a COVID vaccine. The third and final step is that of um, packaging and labeling, and we are obviously also doing that. Now, to be frank with you, that is not enough because you've got to be in control of the entire value chain, right from active substance through to packaging and labeling, and then you can go out with confidence and say, we've got security of supply for these vaccines. So lastly, just to finish off, what is it going to take for, for Africa or our own country to get there? Um, there's a lot that's been said about intellectual property waivers and skills transfers. Those are the initial steps. The things that we really need on the continent, and I'm happy to unpack these later on, I'm happy to have an RP discussion uh, because we went through this with HIV and AIDS and antiretrovirals. Um, Aspen, we're in exactly the same position 20 years ago. And I think together with other partners, civil society and others, we're able to solve this problem. Now, it should be no different this time around, but it's going to require two things, in my opinion. Number one is technology availability and transfer. Now, that doesn't mean an, an RP waiver if I give you Bassani my IP tomorrow and you don't have the technology, don't have a capacity, I'm not really giving you much, right? It's a first initial step. What Africa needs is technology transfers, know-how transfers and skills transfers. And know-how transfer can mean anything from unlocking a, an active, sub, uh, sorry, an inactive substance or a vial or a particular machine or equipment that you otherwise could not get access to. Some of these things are patented. So understanding the know-how is very important. So that is the first thing that we need. The second thing is we need a, a, a full reorientation of the current global procurement dynamics. So what I mean by this is to, it's no use putting up facilities in Africa and they become white elephants a year later because Gavi and COVAX and all these other facilities are buying the vaccines, but they're not buying them from Africa. So we need a guaranteed offtake for African companies so that they, we can keep these facilities sustainable. It's, it's, it's not going to work if the, the current donors, both countries and, uh, and uh, donor funds are procuring their vaccines and other medicines for that matter out of traditional Indian and European sources. That will not give Africa the opportunity to ensure its own security of supply and its own health security. So, Bussani, before I hand back to you, for me, those are the two most important considerations right now. Number, number one, technology transfers, but it's got to be know-how transfers, skills transfers, etc. And secondly, we need these global multilateral procurement vaccine and drug procurement agencies to start procuring from African companies, or we will never be able to build our own industry on the continent and or keep facilities sustainable into the future. So thanks very much for this opportunity again.
Uh, thank you, uh, Martin. Okay, so thank you very much. And so first of all, I'd like to just begin with a personal note. It's a great pleasure for me to be talking at this because my grandfather was professor of archaeology at Witz many years ago, and I believe his brother still has a museum in his name somewhere on the Witz campus. So really a great personal pleasure for me to be here. Now, um, let's quickly go into to, to vaccine inequity because what we're seeing right now with COVID is, is a a real, the real problem is vaccine inequity. We've got um, many parts of the world where they've got 40, 50% of the population vaccinated, but of all the COVID vaccines that have been distributed, less than 0.2% have gone to the low income countries. And so we've got this huge vaccine inequity, but this is also resulting from vaccine nationalism, where we've got countries saying we're going to vaccinate our population first before we share our vaccine with, with you, another country. Now, this is not the first time we've seen this. This has happened before. I'd like to point to 1976, United States of America. There was a, a, a swine influenza outbreak and the CDC estimated they would need to vaccinate 80% of the US population and overnight the USA stopped exporting their influenza vaccine to Canada. Canada was saying we've got this outbreak as well, please provide us with vaccines, USA said no. As a result of that, you, the Canada then built influenza vaccine facilities, which later on were providing the US, because in the meantime, the US had switched down, switched off their influenza vaccine. So this is not the first time we've seen, we've seen this. And what we'd like to say is hopefully this is going to be the last time. Because when in 2005, there was an H5N1 scare, we really thought that H5N1 was about to cause a pandemic. There were screams of unfair, unfair, unfair from Indonesia, from Thailand, from South Africa, from Brazil, saying it's not fair. You, the the folks in the north and the west, you've got the vaccine technology, uh, you've got the vaccines, we've got the disease, or we, we, we think we'll have the disease. And at that time, we, WHO, we went around the world trying to promote influenza vaccine production in the low and middle income countries. And the way that we did this was we set up a what we call a technology transfer hub. And this is what I'll get to in a moment, because this is what we've just announced being set up in Cape Town. So um, the technology transfer hub, we, we set up instead of sending experts to Indonesia, to Thailand, to Brazil, to Bolivia, to Mexico, et cetera which was taking a lot of time, we said, let's set up the full industrial process in one place. And then all of the countries that want can come to that one place, learn how to make influenza vaccines, go back to their countries and establish the full industrial process. And I want to emphasize, this is not training at the university bench. Training at university bench is fun, but it's not useful in terms of production. You need to be trained inside a manufacturing facility, in, which is following good manufacturing practices. And you need to walk out with all of the, operate, the standard operating procedures. So this takes time to set up, but it is a very effective method of transferring technology. So we set out to do that and it worked a bit and sometimes it didn't work. So let me quickly walk about, talk about some of the reasons why it might not have worked and what supports local production of vaccines. So first of all, there must be a need for the vaccine. And the problem when we're talking about pandemic response is what are you going to do in between the pandemics? So building a pandemic influenza vaccine facility, this was a great idea in 2006. It actually had benefit in 2009 for some countries. But in the meantime, after that, a lot of the countries that built them looked at their facilities and said, you know what, we don't really get influenza all that often. So this facility is costing us a lot of money to maintain. We are going to switch it off. So those facilities have been switched off, mothballed, broken down. And what Stavros just said, talking about white elephants, there is a huge risk of building white elephants, especially if you're talking about building for pandemic response. So anything that's for pandemic, it must be sustainable. That means it must be able to do something from Monday to Friday basis or January to, to, to November basis, maybe producing a pandemic uh, candidate where once per month or once per year, just to keep the staff trained. But if you, you cannot build a facility that's just waiting for a pandemic. Now we've got armies, armies are waiting for us to be invaded and we're prepared to do that. But we're not prepared to build a facility that's just waiting for a pandemic. 
So this brings this, so we first of all have to have the need and the opportunity, and then the second one is the sustainability. And Stavroth has very elegantly discussed the challenge of building facilities, especially in Africa, where half, at least half the countries, more than half the countries, their vaccine procurement is first of all subsidized through Gavi, and the procurement is done through UNICEF in Copenhagen, where they're able to negotiate very good prices. Um, because of the mass of supply. And this means that it's going to be quite difficult for a producer in Africa to compete with the Indians, the Europeans, the Chinese, the Koreans, unless a market shaping activity is put in place that is going to really say, we are going to first procure from Africa for Africa, and we are prepared to do so by giving a premium of 10%, 20%, whatever it's going to be over and above the international market price for a limited period of time. I want to emphasize that Brazil has done this. If your vaccine is produced locally in Brazil, the government procures with a 20 or 30% premium. Indonesia has imposed a rule. You want to sell the, the product in India, you have to have a plan of having local production within 10 years. Even if that local production is just full finish, they want to have some contribution to the local workforce. But then when we want to talk about local production, and Stavros has already mentioned this, the first and most important thing is the know-how. So we can, we can talk about, well, we can give you technology transfer to, to get know-how into the country, but it's difficult to do technology transfer unless there is the capacity to absorb the technology. And the, the experience that my unit has had around the world in multiple countries is to go in with well-meaning trainers, but great difficulty to actually establish the process because the workforce has not yet been brought up to a capacity where they're able to absorb the technology. And we have seen multiple failures where we train, things look okay for a couple of months, the trainers walk away, and within months or years, the quality has gone down to the point that the regulatory agency says, this doesn't, this doesn't meet the, the necessary requirements, and the production is closed. So we, there needs to be a technology transfer, a know-how transfer, but this also needs to be accompanied with a capacity in the country to receive the technology. Now, South Africa should have this capacity. South Africa has got nine of the 10 top universities in Africa, but what South Africa has been lacking in the past has been a significant critical mass of biomanufacturing trained workforce. And this is a chicken egg situation. How do you get that workforce trained unless you've got industry where they can work? So I hope that we're getting to the cusp now where that workforce is going to become adequate for a now a long and continuous flow of know-how into the country. Now, along with the know-how comes this topic of, um, of intellectual property. Now, I'm going to just a quick lesson, intellectual property 101. There is no such thing as an international patent. So when the University of Pennsylvania, as an example, discovered or invented modified um, RNA as a method of making mRNA vaccines, they filed the patent in the USA, Canada, Europe, Australia, Japan, Korea, Singapore, and Israel. They did not file that patent in any country on the African continent. Why didn't they do this? Well, most groups that invent and make, make right patents, they look at the cost of filing the patent and saying, if I file this in the 192 countries on earth, this is going to cost me about 20 to $30 million per year just to file and maintain. But if I only file in the industrialized countries, that's where I want to protect my market. So Africa as the continent has this huge opportunity that for the most part, technologies have not been patented. They've not been filed in Africa. So talking about patent waivers for the COVID vaccines, the, the question then is, okay, which patent are we talking about? Are there any patents in Africa, in any country in Africa, that are preventing anybody making any COVID vaccine in any African country? For the moment, the answer is no, there are not. So for the moment, a patent waiver will not contribute. But to come back to what was said at the beginning, the waiver could theoretically become useful because unfortunately what can happen is that people have 31 months between when they make the invention and when they file the patent 
finally. So it is possible that there are going to be some groups that invented, well, they'll say they invented a COVID vaccine in January or February of last year when the vaccine, when the outbreak began, they would still be legally entitled to file their patent in South Africa. And unfortunately, South Africa does not have what we call a substantive examination process. So this means that if they file the patent, the patent is likely to just be granted without looking at it and say, does this meet the requirement of being inventive, of being novel, and of being useful? So um, just a quick word, therefore, of what WHO is doing in South Africa. So um, in the middle of April, we, we decided that it would be really important to increase the capacity of countries, especially countries in Africa, to be able to produce COVID vaccines. And we decided that mRNA would be the best place to start this because it is the technology that has potentially the greatest application beyond COVID. We think it can be used for COVID, for COVID variants, for TB, malaria, possibly HIV, as well as a number of zoonotic diseases. So there's a huge potential of one technology being used for different diseases. So we issued a call for proposals, several African countries applied. Congratulations to South Africa for having submitted the best proposal. This is not only because of the infrastructure you have, but also because of the academic know-how within the country, because of the state of your regulatory agency. So we are now, this is being done with Afrigen and BioVac in South Africa, as well as several universities in the Medical Research Council. We are now going to be bringing technology to Afrigen, for it to be established at Afrigen. And once the technology is established at Afrigen, we will then be asking manufacturers from around the world, but of course, the first will be BioVac from South Africa, to receive the technology and establish manufacturing processes. So this then brings the question of, well, which technology? So we're in discussion with a lot of groups, and we've got those groups such as Moderna, Pfizer. We're talking to them. I can't say whether the talks are going well or not. The advantage is their technology is known, so there's no risk. But the disadvantage is they are likely to say, okay, we'll give it to you, but, but, and there's always that but, but you can only use it in the following circumstances. You can only use it in the following countries. What we want is ideally is something that's much more open source, that South Africa would be able to use it for any disease that it wanted, would be able to take further further IP on it if it wanted, but would be able to share with all of the other countries in Africa and beyond. So therefore, we're also talking with groups that are far more upstream. And unfortunately, these groups, while their technology might be programmatically much more suitable for Africa, in other words, it's got thermostability. It doesn't have to be stored at minus 70 or minus 80 degrees. It's thermostable. It's got tech, it's much cheaper because it's using a much lower dose of the expensive mRNA. Um, the synthesis of the mRNA is something that could be done locally in, in, in Africa without having to be dependent on the reagents from the USA or from Europe. What we don't know is whether that technology will work. And we've just seen recently that one mRNA technology from CureVac in Germany, we were all expecting great results. Well, the results have been disappointing. So as we choose the technology, we need to be quite careful that we are making sure that Africa and South Africa in particular, first of all, gets the know-how for a technology that will be useful in the country, but also a license that will enable to be used beyond just COVID in the country that will be enable the facility to be sustainable because it could be used for TB, malaria, HIV, beyond that. And um, also that it can be, can be shared with countries elsewhere in Africa and the other low and middle income countries elsewhere on earth. So I, I'll stop there. Um, and once again, just to congratulate South Africa for having really submitted a fantastic proposal to WHO, and we look forward to working with the South African government and the consortium and the Wits University um, staff uh, over the next several years in establishing first mRNA vaccine production, and then hopefully other vaccines later. Over. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much for that intervention. Uh, I'm sure there is already some questions that are arising uh, based on your intervention. Let's go straight to Claudina and we'll come back and have a conversation afterwards. Uh, let's hear from your policymaker. 
Well, I'm not so sure about that label, but yeah, let's try. I'm a civil servant, but let's see what, what I can do. Um, thank you to Martin uh, for, for assisting us with this whole process of, of building capacity in South Africa. And my Stavros is sort of, I think, he's stolen all my ideas already at this stage. But I think one of the things that we need to start looking at is what are we doing from the South African government side? Um, we all know there's, there's the Ministerial Advisory Group on Vaccines and that are sometimes in the firing line, sometimes the Department of Health people are screaming on why don't we have vaccines and things like that. But we actually need to see what is going on. So um, since, um, Professor, uh, since uh, President Ramaphosa for has actually partake in this 4th of May 2020 in the um, global uh, pledging conference and as a result of that your COVID-19 tool accelerator was created a lot of activities has been going on within Africa to see to what extent can we go beyond not only looking at how to procure the vaccines but also how can we then build the capacity uh, within Africa so you have the COVAX facility and the activities that Martin was talking about falls within the COVAX facilities but you've also got the activities from the African Union what look at how can they accelerate then the the access to these vaccines not only via COVAX but also via their own efforts within um, Africa. And one of the things is specifically how to scale up the manufacturing capacity with the long-term goal of producing vaccines. So all of this basically using the, the crisis created by COVID to, to see to what extent can we then actually build the capacity as such. So there are the, the international discussions around the waiver, there's the, the, the um, pushback from a number of countries. There's countries like the US and France that said, yes, they are in support of what we are doing. But in fact, the reality is you still need to be able to, to receive the technology on your side. And if we do not have that ability, then, then we, we're wasting our time. So the whole mRNA hub that is in the process of being created is based on the the technical know-how that's already in South Africa, the facilities that are available. But beyond mRNA, we also are looking at other um, protein subunit vaccines. We are looking at your adenovirus vaccines and bring all of those technologies because it is in the long term to build that sustainable capacity within South Africa and that can be then utilized across Africa as such. So when you start looking at your, your IP issues, it is not only the IP for the technology, we also need, need to look at when you start putting these facilities together, there's the whole issues around the availability of equipment, the access um, to consumables, which country laws are actually prohibiting the companies from exporting in a time of crisis and how it then actually affect the, the activities such as this mRNA hub that we would like to, to put up. And I'm sure that, that uh, both um, Aspen and um, BioVac are also in their uh, full finishing efforts. They are running into some of these consumable issues as such. So Aspen has been very proactive and they secured the ability then to manufacture the J&J &J vaccine. But at the same time, we must, there are the ability then at BioVac to go beyond and they are looking at, they are doing the full finishing for a number of the childhood vaccines. So we do have that, that we need to expand on then going forward. So we also need to be aware that there's a lot of pressure on uh, South African government to buy various vaccines, groupings within South Africa screaming for this vaccine, screaming for that vaccine. But we, we have to be very 
cognizance of the scientific process that needs to be put into place to evaluate these vaccines. For one of the major problems that we are actually confronting in South Africa is the variance of concern that is, around, uh, that is running around in South Africa. And if you start looking at those, the, the, the beta variant, and now the Delta variant that's becoming the, the uh, predominant variant in South Africa, how does that actually affect the effectiveness of the vaccines? And which vaccines are then appropriate? And, but on top of that, we do have a very large HIV positive uh, population that we need to also need to look at how does these vaccines actually affect them? Which ones are the most effective to, to provide to these things. So it's a lot of scientific things that needs to be uh, evaluated up before the government actually can go through the process and say, yes, we will buy this vaccine or we will buy that vaccine. Um, you've all seen now the numbers of the vaccines. COVAX is providing us with a lot of the, the vaccines, j and j as well as Pfizer. And then there's also the sort of weekly um, supplies that is being provided by um, Pfizer and uh, J&J that we are grateful that we now suddenly can start rolling out this. But it's not an easy thing to do to, to negotiate it up to this, this process. But in the process, as we go forward, we are part of Africa. We also need to see how we can then assist the other countries in Africa. And we need to keep in mind that um, for Celine Ramaphosa is also the co-chair of the ACT Accelerator, as well as the African Initiative. So, so we are finding vaccines for our citizens, but we also need to look from our perspective, how do we then build these capacities across Africa? And for this, I'm very grateful for WHO, willings, willingness to walk this path going forward from us. Thank you for now. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> um, thanks, Claudina, for that. Thanks, colleagues. Um, as I indicated, there are questions that are in the Q&A platform. I'm requesting all of you to, to read those questions that are on the, on, on the platform so that we can get back uh, to those questions and, and answer them. Um, Stavros, there was a question to you in the Q&A you know, platform. So I'll give you an opportunity to come in first also to respond to some of the issues that were raised. But on the basis of the intervention that you had made earlier on, you are basically saying, even if there was a waiver today, say there's a waiver, there's goodwill from all fronts, you are saying that it will not be possible for South Africa, given all its capacity to start manufacturing vaccines tomorrow. I mean, with all the pharmaceutical companies that we have uh, in the country you know, today, so none of them will be able to start manufacturing next week. Why is that the case? Because there's an impression that we do have factories, we do have scientists and some know-how, in the past, we used to manufacture vaccines anyway. Why will it take longer than, than three months to start producing a vaccine in full, not you know, what you are doing in the, in, 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 in the Eastern Cape, uh, as, as it were? What, what do you mean in layman's terms when you talk about a lot more capacity that is required before we can fully and effectively develop our own, uh, our own vaccine? So I'll, I'll, I'll start with you. I've also asked my colleague, Alex, who in fact is, uh, will be helping us uh, later on to do a summary of this uh, conversation. I've also requested him to look through the platform and will giving you one or two hard hitting questions, each one of you as panelists. Uh, Stavros, I'll start with you. Thanks, uh, thanks uh, Chair, uh, Chair of the session. Um, so the best way for me to respond and then I'm going to respond directly to your question, and then I think there's a there's a question in a chat group I'm happy to take as well. But just to respond to your question, the the, the easiest way for me to explain this, and I'm I'm not sure who's on the. Uh, I see there's 74 participants, but I'm I'm not sure 
whether many of these participants are scientists or pharmaceutical engineers or the likes thereof. So um, if, if this is an oversimplification, I apologize in advance. So supposing we were asked to bake a cake, right? you would have a recipe, which is what we call the formulation. Okay. This applies not only to vaccines, but generally with any pharmaceutical product. Um, the, the recipe or the formulation will tell you you've got to put two tablespoons of, of sugar and um, baking soda or baking powder, whatever it is, it will give you all of that, right? Okay. Then you'll have to go and buy these ingredients. Some of them you'll buy from checkers. Some of them you'll buy from uh, a, deli a delicatessen. So there are various places you've got to go and buy this stuff, right? And then you also have to put water in and milk and the various grades of milk and various grades of water. You know, they, they say you, might, you can't use tap water. You've got to use distilled water, whatever the case might be. And then you've got to, once you've got all of that, you've got to use the right oven. So what I'm saying, when you put all of this together, okay, if I just tell you, here's a list, this is the formula. It's, it's two tablespoons of sugar, uh, mazina, baking powder, icing sugar, etc. Okay, but you don't know exactly when to put these ingredients in and where to buy them from, what equipment to use. If you don't know all of that, that's the know-how that I'm talking about, right? And if you take someone like me, uh, um, I, I sometimes bump into Alex at restaurants, and he knows I, I always. You might have met my family. For someone like me, Alex, I don't know how to cook. I, I'm totally reliant on restaurants. If you put me there to bake this and I've got no skill, I'm not going to get this right. So, Busani, this is what I'm saying. You can say to me, here's the formula for the cake, the recipe. Now, you go away and you do it. Okay. I'm not me, as Stavros, who cannot bake a thing to save his life is not going to be able to make it. So I'm also saying in South Africa right now, we, we don't have the technology, let's start there. And I'm talking the active substance uh, here, colleagues. Um, remember at the outset, I said there were three stages to producing a vaccine. I'm focused on the first, which is the most important stage because you can have fill and finish capacity. You can have packaging and labeling capacity. But if you don't have the active substance to start off with, you're not going to ensure security of supply. And that is why when Martin was speaking earlier and other global initiatives to backwardly integrate into active substance, this is why it is so important. So I'm focused on that aspect. And I'm saying right now as we sit as a country, we can do fill and finish. It's not easy to do. It requires significant investment, uh, significant capability, which Aspen has built over, over time. And it's not just any sterile manufacturer that you can pick and select tomorrow morning and say, well, go and make a vaccine or fill and finish a vaccine. It doesn't work that way. But in many respects, that's the easier thing to do. The difficult part, as I keep saying, is to produce an active substance. And as we stand here right now, we don't have the technologies as a country. Now, Martin and WHO and others are trying to assist to facilitate that, that technology, but they've got to have a willing provider on their side to say, well, I'm Moderna or I'm BioNTech, Pfizer, and I'm prepared to share my technology and do a technology transfer. We're not at that stage yet as a country. The second thing we need is, of course, we need the the know-how, I've just explained that. And there's a lot to be said around, and Martin alluded to this point as well, and I think so did Claudina to an extent. Uh, there are patents on many, many different things. They're, you know, in, in this active substance production phase, you use things called bioreactors. And these are like big cylinders, and there's a lining around this cylinder. Now that lining is patented. So you need access to all of these things if you're going to get 
it's not just about the patent. It's now you must get the lining from so and so and the bioreactor from Bosch, wherever it comes from. So these are all the things that go into uh, making this active substance. And regrettably, at this point in time, although we have taken the first few steps as a country, we are not in a position right now to manufacture our own active substance, whether it's an A26 viral vector, an, an mRNA-based technology, a protein-based technology, we are not as yet in that, in that position. And then my concluding remark is, we can get to that position because some of these mRNA technologies uh, come in a modular form. So once you agree a, uh, a technology transfer arrangement, and as I said, we've got experience in doing these with ARV drugs. It's, 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 a, it's a lot easier with ARV drugs, but we have got experience as a country. It's not like we've got no experience. But these mRNA technologies come in a modular, so it's like a container. It's almost a plug and play. Okay. But to do the plug and play, it can take you six to nine months. It's going to require people being trained at the facility of wherever a European manufacturer or whatever the case might be and then coming back and doing a train the trainer and upskilling your own uh, your own employees in this country so that you can get into proper active substance production. Okay, so I think that answers a question Bussani you posed to me. I see there are many others in the chat group. I don't know if you want me to take them now, those directly. Yes, please, please, yeah. Maybe take two more, yes, please. Okay, so let, let me just start off with, um, uh, the, there's a question here that says, um, sorry, let me just find the technology. Technology is letting me down, sorry. Okay, it says in yesterday's New York Times, J&J were fined 230 million dollars. Okay, so, I'm, I'm not sure that I can really comment much on this other than to say that um, j, j has a contract manufacturing relationship with Aspen. The nature of that relationship is they transferred the full and finish uh, technology to us. There was a skills transfer element to that as well, but we had, of course, the base sterile capability, as I explained earlier, um, so I can't really comment on, on the fine that they have to pay. The only thing I can say is the opiate, uh, the opiate crisis in the US is an epidemic in itself. And we know that there's been significant oversubscribing and over dispensing, not only through J&J &J drugs, but many other companies are involved and I understand they're also looking at settlements but it wasn't only the drug companies, it was also the wholesalers and also the what we call the retail pharmacy chains like Walgreens and others that are involved in that as well. So that's the only sort of additional comment that I can make. Okay, then um, a question around the beta versus the delta variant. So it, it is true, and you would have seen this in the media colleagues, that the Delta variant has started to emerge in our country. It's not as yet the dominant variant, but it could very well become so in the next few weeks. So the South African, we started off uh, last March, our first reported cases were the Alpha variant, which is less contagious than the Beta variant. In October, November, we started seeing the Beta variant in South Africa that was 60% more contagious than alpha. And um, we, we, we saw a significant uh, spike and peak in cases over November, December, it started coming down in January. And now we are starting to see the emergence of the Delta variant. And the Delta variant is more contagious than the Beta variant. But to answer the question directly, that's been posed in the chat group. Of course, when you see the emergence of other variants, you do look at your full armamentarium of vaccines that you have at your disposal. 
And that could mean even some that you might not be using or might not have been applicable in other ways that you do look to see how those work for that particular dominant strain or variant at that point in time. So I think all the options are open again for assessment in this third wave where we are starting to see a dominant Delta strain coming through. Okay, and then lastly, there's a question around, around PAHU. I think the, the, the simple response without getting too technical because PAHU can get, you can get in quite a technical discussion, but all, all I was trying to say earlier is that the, the solidarity principle of, of procuring vaccines so that the less developed and, uh, and, and developing countries are able to benefit from this, I think the procurement cycles of these things, whether it's through UNICEF, the PAHU initiatives, Gavi, COVAX that we're seeing now, there has to not only be an equalization of, as, as both Martin and, uh, and Claudine have raised, not only an equalization of the supply of vaccines globally, but also where those vaccines get procured from. Otherwise, we will never build capacities on the continent and we will never be masters of our own destiny as we ought to be when you are dealing with people's lives, vaccines and pandemics. Thanks very much, Basani. Back to you. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, Martin, let's come to you and... Uh, as you deal with some of the questions, Martin, uh, I have a question also for you on the basis of what uh, Mr. Nicolau just said now. How do we explain the fact that countries like uh, Cuba are reported to be trialing their own homegrown vaccines within a context of a blockade, which means they don't have access to the technologies that countries like South Africa can immediately access because we don't have a we don't have a blockade. Okay, I mean, there's this look. There's many factors here. So first of all, just I'd like to come and repeat what what Stavros just said. Stavros, absolutely right. You know, uh, the problem is South Africa. If we come back to the cake cake uh, example, South Africa has got flour, it's got maizeine, it's got eggs, but it doesn't have any any chefs, any chefs that that have got the experience of making cakes. Maybe South Africa knows how to make uh, a good braai with bourgeois, but it doesn't know how to make cakes. So if if South Africa was now received the recipe for a cake, um, it would take several years of test trial and error to get them to be able to make the cake unless a master chef came along and taught them how to make the cake. And once they've learned how to make one cake, they will find making the next cake somewhat easier. Now let's look at Cuba. The decision was made many years ago, I think in the 1960s, when Fidel Castro, recognizing that Cuba did not have many natural resources, he said Cuba is going to become a knowledge-based society. And the decision was really made to focus on medicine, medical sciences, and Cuba became very strong on medical sciences. Um, in the early 1990s, when groups were trying to make a meningitis vaccine, um, at that time I was working for a big multinational, we went to Cuba to discuss acquiring the Cuban technology to bring back to Belgium for a meningitis vaccine. So Cuba has been developing their know-how. They've got an extremely well-trained workforce there. They've got multiple centers of biotechnology. They've got at least three vaccine manufacturing plants that have been producing vaccines, predominantly for Latin America, but they have been exporting a lot to Latin America. So I'm going to then follow from this explanation that they've got this know-how and, and they've got this, they were exporting to Brazil, to Nicaragua, to Argentina. Much of Latin America was procuring vaccines from Cuba for a long time. So I'm just going to touch on that about what, which are the countries that have succeeded? Let's look at the countries that have succeeded in establishing vaccine manufacturing. Well, we've got the Europe and US, that's a historical thing. But also within Europe, I want to point out that of the 27 
European countries, 28 if we include the UK. If we go back 50 years ago, there were 28 vaccine manufacturers. At that time, there was also vaccine manufacturing at BioVac in Pinelands, uh, Cape Town. So what happened over the last 50 years is that there's been a consolidation. This has been because we've been recognition that vaccine manufacturing can be dangerous. If you don't make vaccines properly, it actually carries a risk to the population. So there's been an increasing regulatory demand. With this increasing regulatory demand, this has meant that the infrastructure requirements, the know-how requirements have gone up. And all of these countries that used to make their own vaccines realized that they could no longer maintain that type of infrastructure know-how that was necessary, and we saw a consolidation. In Europe, it came down to essentially two manufacturers, two in the USA, and India had a lot of um, government-owned manufacturers. These also began to, um, I'm going to say, implode over time as a few big private manufacturers began to emerge. Now, why did this work in India? And this is because, first of all, I'm going to say economy of scale. Now, it's, this is very important. If you build a factory, let's say you build a factory in South Africa that is just to produce vaccines for South Africa, the cost of goods coming out of that factory is going to be phenomenal because the factory is going to be a small to mid-sized factory. And therefore, the cost of goods, there's no economy of scale. The cost of goods are going to be high compared with the big factories where they've got a huge economy of scale. So we've seen this recently with a facility in Thailand which was producing influenza vaccines. And the Thai minister came to say, why are we buying a locally produced vaccine when we can buy it on the international market for half the price? And when we explained, well, we, you wanted this factory for national health security, the, the minister said, well, you know, we, we can't continue paying double the price for to procure a vaccine compared to the international market. So this means that big countries that have got a big internal market, it's easier for them. So come back to something Stavros was, was touching on. Unless we are able to build a market where Africa is a single coherent market, it's going to be difficult for any African country to establish a sustainable, competitive product. And this is then the challenge of infrastructure. Are you going to begin by building a, a facility that's just for South Africa, planning to expand it later? That's going to be difficult because the adding on is it makes a lot of capital for not much return. But if you build too big and you don't get the market straight away, that's also very difficult. So we are in a chicken egg situation here where it's quite difficult to break out of this unless we come to a mechanism such as PAHO, where there is a centralized procurement. But we've tried in Africa in the past, we've tried in the Eastern Mediterranean region, it has not been that successful. And that's partly because in Africa, we've got big uh, discrepancy, big distance, um, economic discrepancy between the poorest and the wealthiest of the countries. Um, sorry, does that answer the question? I lost track. Yes, yes, no, it does. Uh, you may wish to, maybe there's one or two other questions in the chat platform that you've picked up before we go to Claudina. Uh, okay, so I mean, there, there've been there've been quite a few a few questions there. Um, so um, the uh, how so first of all, we we've, we set establishing this hub in in South Africa. So I, I want to really emphasize first of all the role, very critical role of the South African universities. We, you know, we South Africa has got fantastic biomedical innovation. The challenge historically has been that this biomedical innovation has not been converted into product. So we need to build this translate. How do we translate from, from academic innovation to products? And to me, this is part of this, the area that's missing. And I'm talking here to Claudina, and I think Claudina will agree with this, that we need this translational infrastructure of how to translate academic thinking into product development. So that's going to require some thinking at the government level of how do we build translational groups. And when you look, for example, just take Boston, one single country, one single city in the USA, there are more biotech com companies in Boston than, than in the whole of Europe, and definitely many more than the whole of Africa. It is these biotech companies with investment, both from the government and from private investors that are able to translate these professors' concepts into products. And most products fail, but a few work. And this is what contributes to the economy and to the health. So then the next question that I see is, um, is a bit difficult for me. 
um, about the, you know, we've got weakened African influence in the global stage due to disintegrated nature. So do we need an integrated African vaccine manufacturing capacity? The challenge of doing things integrated in Africa is, is getting collaboration and cooperation. Now, I hope that with the African Union and the African CDC, we can start striving towards this. So what will be important is that this Af South African hub is not seen as just a national benefit. It is there for Africa. And part of the governance will be the, gov the, the under what conditions will WHO provide support to this hub? What will the hub then need to do to support Africa? So that's how we're trying to get a pan-African approach, recognizing that it, it's, it's not easy because of the, the, many, the many challenges in Africa, especially discrepancies in economic and educational um, um, infrastructure. Uh, there's a question on the urgency to change the South African legislation. So this is my personal opinion here. It's not WHO opinion, but um, it does concern me when I see certain patents being filed and granted in South Africa that should not be granted in the interests of the health of the population. So India has been quite militant in this, of being very careful of not granting what we were going to call follow on patents. So in, in Europe um, and in the USA, in order for a patent to be granted, it has to be absolutely novel and it has to be inventive. But in many countries, South Africa included, if the patent is filed and it's been approved somewhere else, South Africa just approves it. Now, this is because to, to do substantive examination, you need well-trained patent examiners. And this requires a, a, a training process and a length it's lengthy. And it could be that it's, it's not economically feasible for South Africa to do this. But I, I want to come back to what I said at the beginning, and this is going to contradict a little bit something that Stavros said. It's not that there is a patent. Every patent has got to be filed in a country. So if a, if the patent has been filed in the USA and only in the USA, well, that, that means it's not being filed in South Africa. That means there is no patent in South Africa. So this means that if you want to, to make something in South Africa that is patented in the USA, but not patented in South Africa, you don't need to ask anybody's permission. You don't need a waiver. You don't need a compulsory license. Let's go back to the HIV drugs, the antiretrovirals. These were patented. The, the patents had been filed in South Africa by, by Russia at the time. And so South Africa issued a compulsory license that said, we are going to enable local production. But for the moment for vaccines, um, there are certainly for the COVID vaccines, there are no patents on the John, on the on the Adeno 5 from Oxford, there is one patent in South Africa. So in, th in theory, you can't make an Adeno 5 based um, a COVID vaccine in South Africa, unless you, you ask uh, Oxford University to give you a license. Um, but certainly for the mRNAs, as of today, there is nothing. It doesn't mean there won't be something tomorrow. But these patents are not the main barrier. Making vaccines is difficult. You ask the question of why, why we've got these pharmaceutical companies. Why can't we make vaccines in three months? I'm going to give you, just give you a few examples from my past. Some years ago, um, the company I was working for um, was trying to make a, a pneumococcal conjugate vaccine. And there were no patents on the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine. This is for pneumonia. It's used in South Africa. It costs South Africa a lot of money. Well, the company abandoned the approach simply because it was too difficult and we had a well-trained well-trained workforce now the indians are making it um so you know it's not that difficult but we gave up some years ago with the company that I was with at that time simply because it was too difficult so making drugs if you give me the the chemical structure for some novel hiv drug give me uh, your south african manufacturers i'm certain we could have it made within six months but you asked me to make a vaccine, even a vaccine that I've already made in my past, it will take me five to seven years to do this in South Africa. And one of the key reasons is, is that unlike drugs, there is no such thing as a generic vaccine. Every single vaccine has to go through a phase one, a phase two, and a phase three study. And this adds time, it adds cost. And for some of these studies, these are going to be big studies. So making vaccines is different to making drugs. They are completely different. It's a different set of workforce. It's a different set of skills, a different set of know-how, and a different regulatory pathway. 
So this must be looked at. South Africa has, I think, all of the tools necessary to start, but this is not going to be something that happens overnight. Over. All right, no, uh, thank you for that. Um, I'm going to ask, uh, give an opportunity to two voices. One, I'll start with the colleague, um, Alex, to ask a question thereafter, and he's gonna come back later on to summarize. Thereafter, I'm gonna ask one of the people who are attending, David, to ask a question. So over to you, Alex, followed by David, back to back. Okay, if if one looks at this as a as a as an overriding strategy, it's it's ex extraordinarily complex um, to get right because there are a multitude of problems that need to be solved. So if we start with the first one, um, the if we had to think why why don't we have the technology? Why don't we have the production locally? It's largely because nobody would be there was no market that was developed for it, and uh, so. The, the key issue here is gaining access to a market at scale in order to allow domestic production to be at scale. Now, if we don't get that, almost everything else doesn't work. So the, uh, the, so the technology transfer, the skills development are all for production at scale, but how does one secure the markets? Now, if that is an end point, the question is what you do first um, to get to that point. So. Uh, so the, you've got technology transfer, patents, skills development. You've got to deal with the potential for conditional contracts in a number of areas, including patents that can't be avoided. Um, you have to develop a subsidy framework that works. You have to develop a, um, a multilateral market, an international market for, uh, for purchasing the product if it's, uh, developed, it's uh, going to be developed at scale. If it's to secure the African market, then you have to ensure that the African market buys into it and that they don't defect and go with other products at some point, completely un undermining the domestic production options. So the, the key questions is sort of two major questions that I'd have is that these are quite a lot of problems that need to be solved. And the question is, what's the process that one is going to design that will, that will be sustained over a long-term basis to make sure that the strategy can be implemented over a period of time and solve the problems. Have we got the right process to do it? Because it's not just about tech transfer. It's also about having a, a very effective um, team of people who are constantly feeding back, engaging and developing the strategy, which includes um, what, what, in, what a government's role needs to be in this. Um, just as part of that, uh, the issue I think that is very important is that this production capability has to be a, uh, a commercial venture. It has to be a commercially successful and viable framework. And so the issue as to why uh, technology, why the product development doesn't turn into, um, into something that's marketable is because they are completely different enterprises. So universities aren't necessarily in the business of commercializing products. So that interface with the commercial environment needs to be somehow coherent. Where the innovation occurs has to be then translated into somewhere that is going to market and develop it. So what is that interface? How is that, does it, how is that developed? And if government is to be involved, what does it subsidize and what does it stand back from? Because this is, at the end of the day, to be sustainable has to be a commercial venture. Um, so, the, uh, so, that, so that leads to the second sort of issue. So the one is the process that deals with these issues that can solve all of these, that can interface with all of the different stakeholders and players and make sure that step-by-step -step problems are solved. Um, the second is what, uh, um, what is the entry point? What is the first set of things to do? Is it the technology transfer or is it something else? Um, is it entry-level production? That is then scaled up into new production, new areas, or is it um, a, a, a wider strategy that involves big, big risks associated with um, uh, with the uh, with the production of uh, of antigens and so on, which which can it, which will be affected by scale. So do you develop the other aspects? and then develop entry level uh, uh, interventions that can grow with very sort of careful marketing and building of commercially viable strategies. Um, you know, uh, 
what it, what's the first step? So it's those two issues that I'm, I'm kind of raising and just sort of posing to people is what is the, what's the process and what's the entry level intervention? Uh, thank you, Alex, for that. Let's go to David. Uh, thanks, Musani, man. Um, I, I won't show the video. I think I'm, I'm in transit. Uh, uh, thank you very much. I, I was caught uh, by surprise and uh, quite uh, interesting comment where, from Alex that says uh, we have a problem of a market or the absence of a market. Uh, I don't know what he means by that. I hope that in the end he can clarify that uh, because uh, clearly through pandemics, there is a market and generally across the world, there is no shortage for a market for health products uh, in general, uh, you know, just as a principle from, from just uh, you know, observation. That's the first point I want to make, but uh, my comment and question is to Stavros. You know, the, the question of cooperation is not only at country to country level, is actually also at the level of state to private sector level. And, and I don't seem to hear that coming out sharply and strongly because you can see in countries like China, Cuba, and others, the entities, the entities that are in the forefront of the production of vaccines are actually state pharmaceutical companies. And this largely is a leadership question. So if you argue or if you suggest that there is a problem of capacity, there is also equally a problem of leadership that has to realize that actually pandemics are going to be with us going forward. And with pandemics, there is only one interest. The interest is survival, is existential, is a national interest. And collaboration between the private sector and the public sector becomes very crucial because the very same markets that you are trying to protect as various private players, you know, J&J &J and all the private players in there, the very same markets that you are trying to protect are actually facing a threat from pandemics because then they, they shrink, then, then there'll be nobody to buy any other products even for, for, for a headache. But, but the point that I, I really want to make is that the question of capacity is not somewhere hanging in the sky and unreachable. It's about political will, it's about will, it's about pooling resources, it's about coming together and working together. There is, there is nothing that stops the private pharmaceutical sector to actually engage the dormant state pharmaceutical uh, initiative in this country to waken it up as part of this initiative. Because in any case, even if we were to have capacity to produce in about three months time, there would still be plenty of space for competition and distribution between the private sector and the public sector. So it does not even arise the issue of self-interest that you know, we, we cannot assist the state to produce or manufacture because we want a slice of the market. There is a market for everybody. Uh, the state will not be able to cater for 60 million people uh, working alone. So the issue of collaboration is not only at state to state level, it's also at private sector to, to state level at the national context. So, 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 I don't seem to hear that coming out strongly from either government side, private sector side, from the academics. Uh, that's the point I wanted to make. And I think Stavros uh, is, is probably best place to, to talk to that. Okay, uh, great stuff. So let me do this, colleagues. Um, we will start with um, Claudina first. 
She will answer the questions and then round up. We will follow with uh, Stavros. He will answer the question and round up. Then we will go to Martin, who will do the same, who will then be followed by Prof. Van der Hefe, who is going to do a summary of the whole session, deal with takeaway, what the next steps ought to be, and whether or not in South Africa we are on the right path based on the intervention that have been made. So it will be Claudina followed by Stavros, then Martin in that order. Um, yeah, um, Alex, thank you for that. But I also want to touch on, on a number of the previous questions that was asked. One of the important things, and if you look at what is the, the, the mRNA hub is doing, is actually really taking the elephant in bite sizes. And it is to, to start establishing the know-how in a small component to be able to, to do, accept it and then also go up to produce up to clinical trial uh, batches level. In this process, they actually then build the capacity. Only then will you start looking at the upscaling to commercial stage and things like that. But a very important component of this is also the research component where a consortium of researchers from the private sector as well as universities and as universities across Africa as well as the African CDC are actually seeing how we can build the research capacity then across Africa in order to make sure that we do have the necessary people to fit into these facilities and, and to make sure that um, we are not reliant on importing the labor that we need for when you start um, expanding this. But also it's important when you start looking at taking these technologies then and start applying it for other things such as different vaccines, but also for some of the therapeutics to make sure that those ones are applicable with for Africa and, and that we provide the inputs then from, from the African uh, scientists into that as such. Um, with regard to the question around ethics, the, the, the ethics as set out by the National Ethics Council with regard to health research is applicable to each and every step. And when you look at the manufacturing side, then your the guidelines with regard to your uh, good manufacturing practice or GMP, that is also applicable. But the moment when you've got a product that needs to go into a human being, then yes, the, the ethics is, is the normal ethics that's, that applies to research projects that, of any research project, any clinical trial that will be uh, done in South Africa. So this will not be compromising on any of the ethical issues going forward as such. Um, with regard to the market, during epidemics or pandemics, there's an enormous market, but once the pandemic is over, we will contract back to your, or even get smaller than your normal market. So we need to look at what will make it sustainable. We will not be dependent on epidemics and pandemics going forward. So when you start looking at which are the best technologies, to go forward, yes, this is this important is to look at that, but then also to have discussions around issues such as should there be a price premium for your local development uh, products and things like that. And those are the discussions that is ongoing at government level with between uh, Department of Health, DTIC uh, and Treasury with science and innovation part of this whole discussions on what will, ma what will make it work for South Africa what will look at these investments. And to follow up on something that Martin has, has mentioned as well, um, we haven't done it for vaccines and biologics, but it is definitely the mRNA hub is the start of that. But for example, for your API of your uh, small molecules or your drugs, we've actually created an API cluster where we start looking at how to bridge that between the academic, um, training to the actual application within a manufacturing environment. So we've actually, all the elements of that sort of a virtual um, pharmaceutical component to, to manufacture APIs has been put into place. We've just done a similar one where we start 
looking at diagnostics and medical devices on how to do it. How do you bring these clusters of people together in order to ensure that there's a product at the end? So we've got two elements already, and it's very easy then to take that same model and then start applying it to, to vaccines and biologics. So, so yes, we are trying to, to, to bridge that gap between academic exercise and actually reality in practice on how do we need to do it. So, but, but the assistance of things like this um, mRNA really sort of leapfrog then it's to make sure that we can actually bridge that faster and so. Thank you for now. Uh, Dr. Nicolau. Th thank you, Chair. Um, Chair, I'm, I'm going to respond to, I think, three, three thematics that are, that are coming through um, in, in, in no particular order. I think le let's just tackle um, the issue of of, of markets and market access and market aggregation where you need to aggregate volumes to get uh, to get economies of scale. And, and I largely agree with Alex's comments uh, earlier. A, start, a starting point for me would be to look at, you know, South Africa is no different to any other country around the world. We, we all want to industrialize. And we all want to create as many domestic jobs as possible. And, we all want to export as much product as possible. Of course, not every country can do that and every country has to play to its specific needs and, and strengths. But it is not uncommon in pharmaceuticals that there are strong localization and or local procurement policies in many different countries around the world. If I just look at, if I look at our BRICS peers, for example, um, Russia decreed a certain percentage by 2020 of the products consumed, pharmaceutical products consumed in Russia had to be produced locally. And uh, we, we had that experience as Aspen. I mean, we, we lost, we just bought these, um, uh, these uh, anti-thrombotic injectable products that were low molecular weight heparins. And we, we suddenly lost all and. We couldn't quite understand why. We tried to work out why. We thought, well, is our price uncompetitive? What is the issue? And ultimately, the issue was that we were not producing these products locally. We were importing them into Russia. Okay. So that's just a Russian example. I can use Guy Harris has raised an issue here, saying, well, can SAPRA, the Drug Regulatory Agency of South Africa, not give preference to registration of locally produced products? Guy, it's a, it's a great suggestion. It's something we put to then Minister Motswaledi, and he gave us in writing that this should happen. But we sit here two years on, and it still hasn't happened, right? So various countries around the world, and I can cite many others, have got localization preference uh, uh, policies in place. We, we have those, and I see my colleague Swasti Samaru from DTRC is on this call. We, we have those policies on paper, but we don't implement them as a country. So it should come as little surprise right now that, like many other countries, we are scurrying around the world trying to secure vaccines. If we were true to implementing our localization policies, I think that we would have been investing in vaccines a long time ago because... There is a market for vaccines in South Africa. We know that prior to COVID, you know, vaccines are not just about COVID. Prior to COVID, our country in the public sector alone was consuming or vaccinating uh, 15 million doses um, through largely through the EPR program. These are pediatric doses, but there's a market that exists nonetheless. Now you would have not had a great appetite from investors to come and invest in vaccine manufacture if you've got a fragmented and disparate procurement policy as is currently the case. Let me cite another example, which is a lot closer to home and will resonate with many people on this call. Um, and 
but Busani and I have spoken about this many times as well. South Africa has the largest antiretroviral market in the world. So we know every month, close on five and a half to six million South Africans are going to take a monthly supply of ARBs. Most of the procurement of ARBs is done in the public sector. The public sector buys around 90% of all the ARVs that are consumed in South Africa. But yet, in the current contract that exists for the two most used uh, combinations of ARVs, uh, triple combinations, around 80% of the product is imported into South Africa. Now, that certainly doesn't help to attract any new investor, and it also doesn't help with existing investors that are in the space because their volume share keeps declining and eventually they're not competitive any longer and they'll eventually pull out of the business. So I guess the point that I'm trying to make here is, and let me hit the three thematics all at once now. now number one, we, we can aggregate a market, it is possible, but it's, it's going to require um, one agency, the AU, to aggregate those markets for us. Number two, it's going to require uh, procurement policies at a country and at a continental level uh, to be implemented. And then lastly, when we say that charity starts at home, it does indeed start at home. So if you're a manufacturer in South Africa with aspirations of exporting a vaccine into the continent, if your own government is not procuring from you, you're not going to get that immediate uh, volume or economies of scale that you need. So for me, it's highly unacceptable that despite all the capacity that exists in South Africa, that we continue to import 80% of our ARVs. It, it just, it, it makes no sense to me. And unless we correct this for vaccines, we will have the same problem with vaccines. The Martin's comments around white elephants will be true and we will never have health or, or uh, vaccine security on, on the continent. So policy, having a clear, concise policy around this with proper policy implementation is for me even more important than the RP. Okay, and it might sound a controversial statement that I'm making. But like I said earlier, you can give me all the RP in the world, you can give me your technologies, I can set up a manufacturing plant, but if I have to shut it down in six months time because there's no volume coming through the facility, then all I'm doing is I'm deindustrializing, decapacitating either the country or the continent. So the number one thing for me, if we're going to take anything out of today's seminar, I really do want to thank the Witt School of Governance again for inviting us. These are very important discussions, they're complex discussions, but important discussions that policymakers get to grips with and act on. If we are to get ahead of the game, and we know what a perilous position we're finding ourselves in at the moment with the vaccine rollout, not only in our country, but on the continent. If we're going to get ahead, we need to, as the starting point for me, let's sort out our procurement policy once and for all. We cannot have this constant hemorrhaging of, of manufacturers on the continent. We cannot continue to create markets for other continents. And then when we need the product, those other continents are keeping, the very continents that we've created a market for are the ones that are keeping the stock or hoarding it for use in their populations first. We cannot be in that position. The most obvious thing to change here is the procurement policy of the country, like Russia has done in other markets. When you do that, and these are my concluding remarks, when you do that, not only are you starting to utilize existing capacities, but you will have investors that want to invest in new capacity. Right now, the appetite is very low if you're importing most of your drugs and vaccines. And just by the way, Pharmaceuticals and medical devices are the fifth biggest contributor 
to South Africa's current account deficit. Every year we talk about localizing farm and every year that deficit keeps growing. So let me go back to what I was saying. Um, we need to change the, the policy so that we never, the procurement policy, so, so that we're never grappling around where we're going to get our stock from, et cetera. And this point for me is a starting point to any localization or capacity building exercise on the continent. And then very lastly, let me just deal with, um, again, the multilateral procurement agencies, because it speaks to, it, it, it speaks to what I've just said and many of the questions that have come up. Vaccines are, are rather unique in terms of procurement because you do have, um, you, you do have a globally coordinated efforts to procure for, for least developed, developing and, and uh, some emerging markets. The, the most prominent of those is, is Gavi. And right now Gavi is procuring very little product out of Africa, there is some small procurement out of the Pasteur Institute in Dakar, Senegal, but, but very little otherwise. And I know this is a chicken and an egg because you can well say, well, well, Gavi aren't gonna buy from Africa if Africa doesn't have a capacity and Africa is gonna say, well, we're not gonna put up the capacity if Gavi doesn't uh, buy from us. So we need the two to work in parallel and contemporaneously here. And that's what we've got to do. So way forward for me is, number one, AU, AVAT, the new platform for vaccines, need to aggregate and coordinate the volumes for Africa. Number two, we've got to accept that not every, not all 55 African countries can have a vaccine plant because you just won't get the economies of scale to be competitive. So we need to have two or three African hubs that are manufacturing for the continent for the aggregated market that I've just described now. And then number three, I, I keep saying and I'm being repetitive now, charity starts at home, let's fix our procurement policies here in South Africa. First, let's just get proper localization. We're supposed to be driving an industrialization or reindustrialization agenda. It's part of the economic recovery plan, the ERP, uh, the, the, the post-COVID economic recovery plan. And we keep complaining that we're importing more and more pharmaceuticals. But unless we fix this once and for all, we will continue to be at the mercy of other vaccine producers who will continue to support their population and citizenry first. Thanks very much. Over. Thank you, Martin, your summary. Okay, so I just want to say, I agree with everything that Stavros just said, and also with his statement that what Alex raised, I mean, this, this is all absolutely correct. So I'm going to try and take a slightly optimistic view. And let's just look at what the strengths of South Africa are that are not being fully used. And let's begin with, unfortunately, the high disease burden. So South Africa has become a, a test tube for TB vaccines, TB drugs, HIV vaccines, HIV drugs, malaria vaccines, malaria drugs, and others. But these are all, it's basically, this is the South African test tube for European vaccines, Indian vaccines, Korean vaccines. So, South Africa could capitalize on, number one, the excellent clinical trial capacity. When, I, when I'm organizing meetings at WHO, quite frequently I've got 10, 20% of the staff of the participants are from South Africa because of the expertise in clinical trials, the expertise in evaluating vaccine efficacy, vaccine utility. So there is a huge strength of public health in South Africa. There's a huge disease burden, which Actually, it's, it's, it's sad to say, but it's a big advantage in terms of developing the vaccines. So one opportunity for South Africa would be to not try and get on the bandwagon by making vaccines that are 20, 30, 40 years old, but rather to focus on the new vaccines. Now, there's a risk here. Risk is that they might not work. But if they do work, first of all, you're testing vaccines that you've made yourself. Secondly, once you've developed them, you've got a huge market 
market, which is just north of you, which um, will, basically this will be the only vaccine available. So this could be the, the first step on the ladder to, to getting sustainable local production. And so when looking at new vaccines, this then brings the question of well, which technology? And I think this is where the mRNA hub could have a big role to play because we've been trying for the last 20 years to make vaccines against TB, malaria, HIV with just uh, recombinant proteins, uh, subunit vaccines with pretty poor success rates. So it could be that by getting on this, using new technologies um, to make vaccines, this might enable South Africa to essentially get a uh, jump ahead of the game because there are no other countries that have both the technology and the clinical trial capacity and the disease burden to do those, to do those studies. Now there could be policy level, policy level work that could be done, for example, South Africa could say, well, if you're going to do clinical trials in our country, we are only going to allow you to do clinical trials on condition that the technology is transferred to South Africa within X years, et cetera. There are other, other ways of doing this. But I, I do think that I'm going to paraphrase what Stavros just said. Um, you've been building markets for, for, the, for, for, for India and for, for China and for Europe and for the USA. Um, You've also been building a test tube for them to develop their own products, which you later on buy. And so maybe it would be time for political discussion around how to reverse that situation and how to use your clinical trial strength and your disease burden as an advantage instead of a disadvantage. So I, I really just want to finish with saying I think South Africa is at a cusp now. There's the opportunity now to get a huge step forwards. It's fantastic seeing um, both bio, biovac and Afrogen, but um, uh, also the, the, the um, Aspen group acquiring the vaccine, parts of the vaccine know-how. I really hope that we can make sure that this becomes the full vaccine know-how, that we build the, vac the, the biomanufacturing workforce. What does also need to be built very significantly is the regulatory capacity, the regulatory agency. So just as a, um, for those who don't know this, WHO classifies regulatory agencies by three level, maturity level one, two, and three. And in order for a vaccine to be approved and exported through the UN agencies, that's pre-qualification, the regulatory agency should be maturity level three. South Africa is currently maturity level two. Uh, so it would be very important that there is a concerted effort to build the regulatory capacity in the country and get the maturity level up to three. And this will support uh, the production in South Africa and the reliable export from South Africa to other markets. So I'll stop there. Over to you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, let me hand over uh, to... Uh, Alex, um, Prof, if you can please do, you know, a, a summary and way forward. What is the takeaway from this? Is there hope for us as a South, South Africa? Are there opportunities that are available? And are we fully harvesting these opportunities that are available? And if I pick on um, a question that David asked earlier on, and in fact, even your own comments, is it possible that there can be a compact in South Africa that will bring together all the social uh, you know, partners and help us develop our own capabilities to develop a vaccine for the current pandemic and many others uh, to come? Over to you, Prop. Yeah, so I think, so what I'm going to do is I think run through a number of the issues that are raised and um, and raise, I think, the, the the sort of the key issues that are going to need to be necessary to, to resolve, to get a strategy going. Um, maybe just to begin with the first point, when, um, when I met with Indian manufacturers in India, for instance, they gave an evaluation of the African market. And uh, when they gave the sort of distribution of volume, of sales in Africa, as far as they were concerned, the market is South Africa, and the rest of the rest of the African continent is pretty uh, minimal, pr principally because of the levels of expenditure um, that the health systems are capable of generating. 
And so they, they, that was their focus. The second kind of takeaway from their approach is that they, they were not looking only at their domestic market in order to generate scale. They had a, an international strategy, a commercial strategy that was oriented toward the, uh, that was global in nature. And uh, I think the third issue from that perspective is that the India, India had a key strategy, uh, a government strategy, uh, which combined with a commercial environment to, to basically make it successful. And without that, we probably, they probably wouldn't have been able to uh, make a success of the overall uh, industrial strategy. So I think that what we're looking at here, uh, to maybe give a comment, is it's a combination of two different kinds of strategies. It's a public health strategy and it's an industrial strategy. And if the industrial strategy doesn't work, the public health strategy might actually be compromised. So I think that's the kind of starting point that I'd have to kind of look at this as a problem. Um, from from the, uh, the comments that are made, it's quite clear that there is a, a coherent business case for this to happen. It's, it's the right thing to try to do and achieve, but it faces a lot of challenges and problems that need to be solved. It will require that there are um, that there is a sort of a, a, a South African a coherent South African strategy, government strategy, which also ties in with the commercial imperatives of the industry. Otherwise, it's not going to be viable or sustainable. And that includes trying to move into international markets, making making the strategy successful for the region, for South Africa as well. But the question is really whether we can generate scale just with Africa and South Africa. And the question really is how we would then uh, solve the problem of accessing global markets as we develop a strategy going forward. Um, so without the development of that, uh, the issue that Stavros raised about the uh, possibility of local um, procurement approaches so market preferences in South Africa. Now they could be successful on their own as a as a uh, as a strategy for purchasing, but if the price differentials are, are incredibly large, even government is going to be reluctant to uh, purchase because if the scale still remains very local, the price differentials, the cost differentials of production might not be sufficient for government to um, uh, to give a, a, a preference. On a, on a sort of wider scale. I would think that could be an obstacle. So the question really is, uh, how does one basically get into that as a coherent strategy going forward? I, I'd agree in the case of the Russian market, the Russian market for medicines is much larger than that for South Africa. So is there enough scale? In terms of the, um, the number of issues that have to be resolved, um, uh, I think that there is that that there are that there are huge opportunities, and I think that some of the points that have been made about leveraging capability that exists in South Africa are very important. The issue is translating them into the um, uh, the sort of from the scientific side, the clinical trial side, into the sort of commercial side, and building that capability going forward. I think the I think it's a very interesting strategy um that it, to focus basically on new vaccines new medicines potentially so this would be wider than just vaccines but focusing on um development uh, r d uh, that moves into areas that in fact international um manufacturers and and sort of uh, innovative work is not focusing on and that can be an important sort of point of entry, but it doesn't necessarily begin with significant scale if the markets are quite restricted, but it is definitely an, a, a component of success that could work, um, I, I would think, that's, that's important. The multilateral agreements, now you can have multilateral agreements, multilateral approaches that um, are organized and disorganized. You can go through an EU structure or you can go through an agency. The question is, what's the institutional framework that, that creates the possibility for stable agreements that involve procurement um, uh, as well as R&D, as well as the technology transfer. So if there's two to three countries looking at technology transfer, the countries with very, very small local demand are not going to be able to sustain it without being able to access a multilateral platform. So the question really is what's the institutional, the stable institutional uh, arrangement that allows for the development of, uh, uh, of markets, which then allow for the development of scale, which allow for the cost of production to be reduced, which also allow for governments to then preference local production as part of their strategies as well. 
So the question is that a strategy to get somebody going um, or is it a strategy that leads toward building scale in the medium to long term and, and what can one create that as an assurance. Um, government side is quite critical because government has to do two things. One is it has to look at its own strategy in relation to this, but it also has to look at the, at it's, it's a key component of developing the multilateral framework. Without government, it's going to be very difficult to do that. Um, so government has to look at procurement, it has to look at subsidies, it has to look at local preference options, it has to look at its relationship to clinical trials. Um, I think the issues of the development of regulatory capacity is also a government strategy that's quite critical. Skills development and support for that can be very important because government subsidizes skills development and it can be prioritized. Um, and, uh, a, 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 and, and one can actually develop that and it's quite potentially a very highly leveraged investment. Um, so, uh, so I think, uh, uh, so uh, I kind of come back, oh, sorry, uh, yeah, so I, I kind of come back to the sort of central question that I had in, the, in, in my question, which I think is going to be very important, is if this is decided, if this is understood as a, as a key strategy to go forward, to localize capability and uh, resilience uh, from a public health perspective, um, it also increases resilience from an industrial perspective because Stavros has comment that uh, we, if we have a medium to long-term strategy of reducing imports that impact on our balance of payments, that's a very uh, important industrial, uh, industrial strategy objective and it can be coordinated into this. So the question is what's the process that gets us forward? And uh, there might be a number of government departments talking to each other at this point in time, but are they able to solve these problems just talking amongst each other? Or does there need to be a process which is, is wider and continuously problem solves in all of these areas so that you can come back in a learning process toward uh, prioritizing interventions uh, that, that will actually work? Noting that not every intervention is gonna work. There are risks, um, there's stuff that will go wrong and it's worth, and, but a strategy like this is potentially worth investing in taking risks, making mistakes, correcting them and moving forward, but continuously progressing. Um, it shouldn't be reliant on very, very um, uh, uh, sort of uh, slim pillars. It should basically build a sort of sustainable process that, uh, uh, that is able to uh, basically co-create these strategies with all the available stakeholders in South Africa and multilaterally and within the region. Um, I think that there are very significant obstacles to, to overcome, um, and, uh, but I, th I do think that they can be overcome if, this is, if the strategy is sustained, coherent, and invested in as a, as a, as a, as a combined industrial and public health strategy. So I, I'll, I'll leave it there. Uh, thank you very much. Alex, please don't switch off your video. Can I request all the panelists uh, to turn on their videos? People must say we're not uh, talking to robots. Anyone who's able to turn on a video should do so now um, so that people can see that we were not talking to robots, uh, but they were real uh, individuals who were here. Uh, I don't see, is everyone here? Yeah. Uh, Colleagues, thank you very much once again uh, for this uh, engaging uh, conversation. We thank you, Martin, for availing yourself uh, under this difficult circumstance for you and your colleagues at WHO and everybody else who took their time to listen to this conversation. I think if anything, what we achieved today is to take this conversation a step further than where we were before. Ourselves in the National School of Government, we are very much interested in this conversation because it's, we are able to bring together policy makers, uh, experts from the higher education sector, the multilateral you know, sector like um, Martin, as well as those from the you know, private sector. And it's important that we must dynamically have these conversations because you can meet and decide if we don't bring policymakers on board as well, you might have the challenge that Alex was talking about now, where there's a disjuncture between industrial policy 
and some of your intentions of wanting to develop you know, vaccines, while there may be many other balls uh, in the air that are not being juggled properly. And because they are made of glass, they may fall and, um, and crack as it were. So thank you once again for being here. This is part of a series. We've got a few others that are coming. We'll also be bringing in WEF as well because they are organizing it on, on, on their you know, side from a global business. We will have uh, Africa, you know, CDC as well, is part of those who are engaging. Also, we will be having bankers, financiers, because some of the things that we raised today do suggest that we must have the ability to raise funding. So those who want to establish you know, factories and enterprises, you know, manufacturing any of the components required in the, in the vaccine manufacturing value chain need access to capital. Is the appetite from amongst those who hold capital to make funding available for, for such? And we have seen them make funding available for renewables and other you know, greenfield industries. It might as well be that this is another greenfield uh, industry, if one could arguably call it that, and there may be resources uh, available but we also take into account the risks that have been shared um, today. So thank you once again for being here. The link will be shared on the YouTube. It's also available via uh, Facebook. Let's educate each other. Let's share more. Let's make sure that as decisions are being taken at multilateral level, as also by you know cabinet and you know governments across the, the globe, we are fully aware of what these implications. Uh, will be of such decisions that are being taken. So thank you very much, colleagues. Please stay safe and have a great afternoon uh, further. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, my co-host, Mzu, and uh, everyone else who was uh, here. Have a good afternoon.